Episode 6 Tanis. The High Lords of Terror, lauding the great victory of Warmaster Slado's efforts on Kulan, tasked him with raising a crusade force to liberate the Sabbat Worlds, a cluster of nearly 100 inhabited systems along the edge of Segmentum Pacificus. From a massive fleet deployment, nearly a billion Imperial Guard advanced into the Sabbat Worlds, supported by forces of the Adeptus Astartes and the Adeptus Mechanicus, with whom Slado had formed cooperative packs. After ten hard-fought years of advance, Slado's great victory came at Balhut, where he opened the way to drive a wedge into the heart of the Sabbat Worlds. But there, Slado fell. Bickering and rivalry then beset his officers as they vied to take his place. Lord High Militant General Dravir was an obvious successor, had chosen the young commander Makaroth. With Makaroth as war master, the crusade force pushed on into its second decade and deeper into the Sabbat worlds, facing theatres of war that began to make Balhut seem like a mere opening skirmish. From a history of the later Imperial Crusades, the arrogance of the man is matched only by his incompetence. This decision, which he seeks to foist upon us, demonstrates he simply does not understand what is out there and what it will take to vanquish it. Lord Militant Kyborn, prior to the Cabal salient advance. The Cabal systems is a worthy goal, but perhaps due consideration might be given to the steps along that path, which manifestly are worthy goals in themselves. General Kelso, prior to the Cabal salient advance. From the War Master to all militant commanders, it has been made known that some commanders of men believe miscalculations have been made in the aftermath of Balhut regarding the strategic response to the arch enemy's retreat. Any officers with such misgivings are invited to attend me personally as soon as possible to present the nature of their concerns fully and completely. Makaroth at the start of the Cabal salient advance. Makaroth had been installed as War Master, but Imperial High Command was not united behind this change. Many thought him arrogant, many thought him inexperienced. Many felt slighted that so junior and unworthy an individual had been propelled through the ranks and given command of one of the greatest Imperial forces currently assembled in the galaxy. A truly once-in-a-lifetime situation, and the opportunity for glory and power was felt by some to be misplaced in Makarov. But being Slado's pick for leadership, the vast majority of the High Command acceded to the wishes of the old man. Additionally, the High Lords of Terror agreed to the ascension of Makarov, so on paper the situation was settled. But behind the scenes conflict remained. Many believed Makarov was making bad strategic decisions. Many believed that they should replace him still. Despite this, and aside from some cliques and factionalism within the Crusade command structure, Makarov more or less secured his position and control over the armies and resources of the Crusade. Following the Imperial victory on Balhut, a small, when compared to the host that had fought on the planet, but still relatively considerable force of the arch enemy managed to escape the system. These forces consisted of the remnants of the Chaos Fleet, which had been smashed and scattered by the initial Imperial assault on Balhut, who had then rallied and managed to extract arch-enemy ground forces from the surface, risking the Imperial blockade surprisingly successfully. These fleets varied in size and scattered into smaller groups as they fled the system. Some of the more significant enemy forces which had broken loose from Balhut managed to slip behind the Crusades lines and began striking at many of the worlds recently conquered by the Imperium. In addition to these splintered remnants of Nadzibar's combined war host, many other forces of arch enemy troops had been en route to reinforce their Archon from deeper within the Sabbath cluster and hearing of his death began to launch their own campaigns deep into Imperial territory, while the majority of the Crusade's fleet assets were gathering at Balhut. Small warbands and full-blown armies, 
individual Chaos raiding ships and full-scale fleets rampage through the newfound trailings group, slaughtering the inhabitants of whole worlds, putting others to the torch or simply hunting out Imperial installations and massacring their garrisons, cutting supply lines as they sought vengeance, safety, or, for the more intelligent amongst them, to regroup with other arch-enemy forces in order to repel the crusade when it attempted to advance further within their territory. Only scattered patrol fleets and garrisons of second-rate Imperial Guard occupation forces opposed them, as Makarov sought to gather the greater part of his strength for a drive towards the Cabal systems. Warmaster Makarov was accused of not consolidating the aftermath of Balhut, but it is evident consolidation was his primary aim. He simply did not consolidate in the way Slade Air might have done. That is to say, he did not order an incremental system-by-system -system securement of the immediate territory, coupled with a firm prosecution of the fleeing enemy forces, before pushing on from a stabilized base against the next line of dispute. Makarov knew Slater had set the enemy running and wished to capitalize on this weakness by thrusting forward boldly on the hunt, instead of laboring to tidy up loose ends. The Cabal system zone, ringed as it was by the infamous Fortress Worlds, would be a gargantuan trophy to take, and Makarov sought to bring the Crusade into striking distance of the Cabal group before the arch enemy could gain advantage by gathering at that point. Makarov was well aware that the forces of the Runa's powers had lost their Archon. They lacked genuine centralized authority, and Makarov's hope was to drive the devastating lance into their very heart by making an orchestrated move that none of the scattered enemy sections could predict or rally against swiftly enough. In short, he did not wish to waste time and manpower clearing the disorganized scattered components of the enemy, but rather strike at the center. As he wrote, I will aim my strike to the head, not the limbs. No one, not the arch enemy, nor even Makarov's generals and marshals, expected him to drive the crusade spinewards across two major system groups to the threshold of the cabal systems. So that's precisely what he did. Excerpt from To the Head, Not the Limbs, in Barheen, Tactical Imperatives. Many of the High Command objected to this move, and dissension was rife, as well as conspiracy. Not only did they object to allowing so many of the enemy to advance and slaughter Imperial worlds left almost defenseless to these splinter forces, but the Cabal worlds themselves were a vast and heavily guarded territory, surrounded by legend legendary fortress worlds. To get there, a vast advance was organised to push through and create a large front along the border of the Cabal worlds, which would then launch multiple assaults simultaneously in echo of Slado's original operation Red Drake, which broke open the newfound trailing group. To get to this point, large stretches of the remaining newfound trailing group's central belt would need to be conquered, and where they remained in Imperial hands, liberated. In addition to these newfound trailing worlds, the Crusade would need to take the Menazoid Clasp and the Khan group. Warmaster Makarov, like Slado, set his mind to a single overriding objective and began to mobilize the might of the Sabbat Crusades to that end. For Slado, it had been the central capital world of Balhut. Although the organization and execution of the Crusade and the great feats accomplished leading to the victory of Balhut set Slado apart in the annals of Imperial history as a truly great hero of the Imperium, Makarov decided upon an arguably more ambitious objective, the reconquest of the entirety of the Cabal systems. One of the many worlds lost as a result of Makarov's decision to press forward rather than waste time and resources hunting down enemy forces that had slipped behind the Crusades front line was the forest world of Tanith. Editor's Note up to this point, this history is drawn primarily from the Crusade archives and those sanctioned academic works from scholars, as well as memoirs and biographies from officers and other Imperial officials, which, following correct censoring, have been made widely available to the general population. 
as well as more technical works utilised for the training of new and future officers and other specialists. From this point onwards, however, this history will utilise these official histories as well as the regimental histories from the TANF first and those other regiments and agencies involved in the same actions. Additionally, it will include personal records and after-action reports that exist from the same. The TANF first under the command of Colonel Commissar Ibrahim Gaunt were to prove pivotal in a number of crucial engagements and through their experience we can explore the true scale and sacrifice of this glorious crusade to retake the Sabbath worlds in the name of him on Earth. Tanith was a relatively lightly populated planet in the Sabbath worlds, which had not fallen into chaos when Imperial authority broke down and the arch enemy spread its influence throughout the cluster. Along with other worlds, it continued unbroken in its loyalty to Terra, and even interplanetary trade continued despite the breakdown of Imperial authority in the region and the sector governor being forced to flee, as well as the end of the Civitas Imperialis. Tanif's only notable export was Nowwood, a highly valuable lumber. The planet had a relatively small-scale lumber operation sh shipping this wood across the Imperium, where it was highly valued by the upper echelons of Imperial society, who purchased it for inclusion in their villas, throne rooms and other visible locations as signs of status due to the expense of shipping the wood from this distant corner of the galaxy. Although a mark of wealth, it was rightly considered an excellent material with a great beauty when shaped by skilled carpenters. Now wood trees are similar to pine trees which are common across the Imperium since the Great Diaspora when that first great wave of human colonisation seeded so many worlds with the fauna and life forms from humanity's birthplace. Now wood trees however were not static and through some means were able to move, and it is speculated that these trees were pursuing the sun or some other climatic event. This meant that regularly the forests of the world would change position, and it is postulated that this contributed to the Tanif's ability to unerringly sense direction and memorize geographical features due to living in continuously shifting environments which then entered the gene pool more generally and became a trait. No extant research has been conducted on the origins of Nalwood or its relationship to the tennis population, so it is not clear whether this ability to move was a natural development through the evolution of an existing Terran breed of tree or a mutation brought about by, by artificial means, perhaps during the terraforming process, or whether it was brought by the original colonists at all and perhaps was a native tree that had developed independently from human intervention. The collection of Nalwood lumber and the production of worked Nalwood items was the planet's main industry, and many of the future ghosts, if not former hunters, worked in the logging industry, as it was the planet's main export. Tanif did have a reasonable technological and industrial standard, able to produce all of the items required for humanity to lead a comfortable existence, without constant resupply from neighboring worlds which in any event it was isolated from being situated along the spinewood border of the Sabbath Cluster and a fair distance from the main trade and warp routes of the newfound trailings group. When chaos came to the Sabbath Cluster, life on Tanith remained largely unaffected, except for, we must presume, the occasional lost cargo hauler. Tanif's permanent settlements sat enclosed within vast stone walls, which the Nalwood trees would be forced to move around. The capital city was Tanif Magna, which was walled in this way, and housed the planetary government and the planet's spaceport. Individual families and small communities did live in the forest themselves, and were attenuated to the constant movement of the trees, perhaps building settlements near geographical features that would be avoided by the Nalwood. These communities would be involved in agriculture, farming and lumbering. Settlements existed along the coasts of Tanith and concerned themselves with fishing and, we must speculate, possibly the collection of Prometheum, similar to other imperial worlds with a need to generate their own energy to support their infrastructure and cities. The Lasguns issued to the Tanith appear to have been manufactured on the world 
as they had now irreplaceable Nalwood stocks. As the crusade progressed, these LAS rifles from the founding would be replaced by those produced on other worlds. The same in every aspect, but lacking this one final link to lost Tanith. The government of Tanith was an aristocratic republican system, where an elector was elected by his peers to rule. Such systems of government are allowed on worlds where draconian measures are not required to ensure the population remains loyal, orderly and productive, and are fairly common on lightly populated or agri and low industrial worlds. As Slado advanced his forces into the newfound trailing group, Tanith, like other worlds, was brought fully back into the Imperial fold. But like other worlds liberated by the Crusade, it now needed to provide the Imperium with resources to be fed into the campaign to propel it onwards and lessen the burden on the highly strained and extended supply lines from outside the Sabbat Cluster. The Administratum determined that Tanith's tithe would be increased and paid by the raising of Imperial Guardsmen to fight for the liberation of the rest of the Cluster. Initially, Tanif would raise three regiments of light infantry to serve the crusade. What future plans the administratum had for Tanif to pay their tithes is at this point redundant, but Colonel Commissar Gaunt had plans to raise additional forces from the world once this initial founding had been bloodied and tested on the crusade's front lines. The Tanif were beginning to recruit and train these regiments as Warmaster Slado launched his attack on Balhut. Following the great victory and Makarov's ascension to Warmaster, the need for fresh troops was great, and an experienced officer was dispatched from the Crusade Command to help lead and shape these foundling troops. Marked for greatness and later honoured by Slado on his deathbed for his feats of valour with the Hierakan VIII at the Oligarchy Gate, which saw the breach of the last main defence of the city, allowing the final assault on Nadzibar in the High Palace the following day. Despite, or perhaps because he was honoured by Slado, and promoted to the rare rank of Colonel Commissar, and even given the rights of settlement for a world he conquered, Gaunt was now considered a political liability within the upper echelons of high command. Seen as one of Slado's chosen, he was not looked upon kindly by Warmaster Makarov, who was swiftly placing his own chosen and trusted officers into positions of command and slowly removing dissenters and those not considered fully committed to the new order. This is perhaps why Gaunt accepted the command of the Tanith. Gaunt entered the Tanith system on board the frigate Nevere and entered orbit along with several transport vessels. Making immediate landfall, he ordered that the men should be embarked immediately wishing to be away from this forest world as quickly as possible and back to the front. It was this decision which resulted in there being any Tanith survivors. The Tanith regiments being formed were light infantry primarily, and the Minotaurum's assessment had highlighted their stealth and scouting abilities as specialities. The regiments were formed and organised along standard Imperial Guard lines, the training they received covered all of the necessities of life within the Guard, including lessons and training with various forms of standard issue weaponry, as well as learning squad tactics and larger strategy. Despite what some may consider savage cultural norms such as tattooed faces and piercings, the Ghosts themselves were fairly well educated and literate people with a good understanding of the universe and of their place in it. Like all loyal citizens of the Imperium, they were devoted to the God Emperor, but their culture appears to have lacked some of the more zealous aspects of Imperial faith, which many Imperial commanders will vouch is sometimes a double-edged sword when it comes to organised warfare. Together with their innate stealthiness and abilities learned from their forest world upbringing, the ghosts utilised cameline cloaks made of a material which blended into their surroundings, which coupled with the ghost's abilities made them adept at hiding from view in most environments, from heavily forested to heavily urbanised zones. Having met the planetary government and elector and gone through the ceremonial formalities from such an occasion, Gaunt was brought the shocking news that an enemy fleet had entered the system and was heading for Tanith, 
with due consideration for the forces at his disposal and the size of the arch enemy force closing on the undefended planet, Gaunt elected to continue to load as many men as possible upon the transports and leave the world with what he could salvage. As the arch enemy unleashed its fire on Tanith, the world burned. The atmosphere was stripped and the vast seas of forests were turned into a terrible inferno. Landings of arch enemy troops occurred in multiple locations and primarily at Tanif Magna, where the local militia and those green troops who could not be evacuated from the planet were smashed by the enemy and the population was butchered. Heading to the spaceport to reach the last shuttle with his adjutant Sim, Gaunt ran into arch enemy soldiers and the ensuing combat saw Sim die. Gaunt was rescued in this moment by a civilian aide who had been assigned to care for him during his stay and also to play the planet's trademark instrument, the Tanif Pipes, as part of a tradition for all strangers and visitors. This civilian, a teenage Brim Milo, manned a heavy bolter and slew Gorn's assailants, and with the boy in tow, they boarded the shuttle and fled the world. With Gorn on board, the Nevea, which had held station at great risk in orbit as the Chaos Fleet launched its assault on Tanith, and the small flotilla with its last remnants of the Tanif population fled the system. Colonel Commissar Ibram Gaunt Gaunt gained his promotion and command from Slado for his actions on Balhut while leading a force of the Hyken 8th in a successful strike on the Oligarchy Gate. Following a counter-attack by the woe machines of Herator Asphodel forcing back the Astartes of the Silver Guard with heavy casualties. The Hykans, with the Emperor's protection, penetrated the arch enemy lines, reached the gate, blowing it, allowing Slado to drive an armoured wedge of four mechanised divisions and the now vengeful Silver Guard into the very heart of the oligarchy. The following day, the city, the main objective of the planetary assault, had been taken with Slado leading the final attack on the High Palace receiving mortal wounds, but destroying resistance within the planetary capital, and slaying the Archon, Nadzibar. Gaunt had already been marked for glory by Slado as a rising officer with great potential within the Imperial command structure. On his deathbed, Slado promoted Gaunt to the rank of Colonel, in addition to his commissariat position, and gave him the rights of conquest for a world he conquered, a great honour for any Imperial officer. Upon Makarov's rise to Warmaster and the internal politicking of High Command, Gaunt was offered the opportunity of command of the new founding of Guard Regiments from the relatively unremarkable world of Tanith, which, before its destruction, he believed could be moulded into a new and large force of light infantry with which he could gain great glory and aid the Crusade in the wars ahead. Unfortunately, with the destruction of Tanith, Gaunt was stuck with half of the troops he originally envisioned, and no way of replenishing their number. Additionally, the morale of the men of Tanith had taken an obvious hit from the burning of their homeworld, and the knowledge that all they knew was lost, and that they were all that remained of their people. Although the first few years were difficult, to say the least, Gaunt, through a show of martial valour and excellent leadership, earned the loyalty and trust of the men of Tanith, even if some understandable ill will remained over the whole situation. Gaunt crafted a disciplined and highly skilled fighting force, which could easily have fallen into nihilistic despair given the circumstances of their formation. Gaunt's command style was highly influenced by his apprenticeship to Commissar General Delane Oktar, who took Gaunt on as a cadet. Oktar and Gaunt served with the Hyken regiments, and particularly the 8th, leading them through many engagements on multiple worlds prior to and then during the Sabbat Crusade. These were formative years for Gaunt's education as a political officer, but also as an imperial officer and leader of men. He learned how to get the best from soldiers as a leader and to act as a symbol of imperial bravery and honour. But also, as a commissar, he was the hand of judgement, for those who failed the ultimate test of loyalty. Unlike many commissars, Oktar was not given to motivating men through fear, and this lesson was passed on to Gaunt through his time with the 8th, and would serve him well in leading the Tanith first, 
earning their trust and loyalty in the years of conflict following their calamitous foundation. Octar taught Gaunt the need for strong command structure, led by exceptional officers selected upon merit, unit cohesiveness, recognising the individual qualities of soldiers, and leading from the front. Octar specialised in turning regiments into elite fighting formations, and the lessons he imparted can be seen realised in the effectiveness of the Tanith first and only. Octar was also a commissar who, unlike many of his colleagues, rarely resorted to the bolter and the firing squad to boost morale and ensure steadfastness. Believing that it was the commissar's role to not only instill fear of failure and the consequences of disobedience and treason, but to inspire the soldiery to feats of valour, for example. Winning is everything, but the trick is to know where the winning really is. We're political animals, Ibram. Through us, if we do our job properly, the black and white of war is tempered. We are the interpreters of combat, the translators. We give meaning to war, subtlety, purpose even. Killing is the most abhorrent, mindless profession known to man, our role is to fashion the killing machine of the human species into a positive force, for the Emperor's sake, for the sake of our own conscience. Commissar General Delane Oktar Gaunt was selected to be a Commissar after displaying desirable traits while in the Scholar Progenia. He was sent there following the death of his father, his mother having died early in his life. His father was second in command to General Aldo Darcius during the Greenskin invasion of Cantor, and as would later be revealed to Gaunt, betrayed and left his father and his unit to be surrounded and slaughtered by the Greenskins, in order to preserve his career in the face of Imperial reverses during the campaign. Later in life, Gaunt would learn the truth of his father's death, would seek out General Darcius, a man he once considered his uncle, and in a chainsaw duel on the planet Keed 1173, would slay this man, he as a commissar, had sentenced to death for cowardice, and in return received a near-mortal blow from a chainsword across the stomach. Darcius was a native of Jantnor Mendus, and a powerful member of the Jant nobility. This was the homeworld of the Jantine patricians, a proud and famous regiment which for 15 generations had provided elite soldiers to the Imperium's armies. The patricians are heavy shock infantry, who dressed in gold and purple dress uniforms, and in war were equipped with heavy armour, including ornate cuirasses. For fifteen generations, they had gained glory for the throne, and for Jant, but the execution of General Aldo Darcius was a black mark on their honour. The Jantine patricians would not forget. Following Darcius' death, his positions and estate were stripped from his family and posterity. His family's name was wiped from Jant's records, such was the horror at this mark on their military prestige. Darcius' old regiment adopted his now orphan and destitute son, who took the name Draker Flans, eventually rising to the rank of Colonel of the regiment, and, along with his men, held a deep hatred and urge for vengeance for Ibram Gaunt. Gaunt gained the knowledge of his father's death while serving as a cadet under Octar. Inquisitorial records show that it was during the Darandara pacification while serving with the Hykens. Once the rebellion on the world had been crushed, Imperial forces moved to consolidate their grip, and the members of the Emperor's Holy Ordos began interrogating the captured members of the leadership to root out heresy. Inquisitor de Fay requested Cadet Gorn's assistance in the interrogation of one prisoner, a female psyker, who refused to cooperate with de Fay stating she would only speak to Gaunt. This girl was a member of the world's elite and Defey believed she knew the secrets of why Darandara had fallen to rebellion. And being one of the more enlightened servants of the throne, Defey believed it worth letting her speak to Gaunt and perhaps gaining knowledge this way rather than risking the more direct methods of interrogation he had available to him. Gaunt met this girl and during her traumatic psycho experience she divulged many truths that would not become apparent until later in life, but she did tell him the reason for his father's death, which Darcius had used his influence to successfully cover up. It would be years later that Gaunt gained his vengeance, when the two were by chance deployed to crush the tribal rebellion on Keed 1173. 
and many years after that, until the other utterances of this psycho girl in the cell on Darandara were truly understood. The frigate Navea had been assigned to Gaunt as the flagship of the small transport fleet that had been intended to carry the new TANF regiments and their equipment and supplies back to the front. Now with only 3,500 TANF having been evacuated from the surface, with the items they were carrying on their backs, a deputation met with Gaunt on board the Navea. Fifteen men had been selected to speak for the rest, and Gaunt requested that they choose three of their number. The three selected were Ilham Rawn, Colm Corvick, and the young Bryn Milo. The discussion was heated. The men were not happy to have lost their world, and, understandably, some of their anger was directed at Gaunt for leaving their world to die, despite the certain death it would have meant for them all. They had lost their chance to fight for their people, their world. Gaunt made clear to them that they were now oath-sworn Imperial Guardsmen, and their duty was to fight the enemies of man, not die in a hopeless battle. You're not men of Tanith anymore. You weren't when you were camped out on the founding fields. You're Imperial Guard, servants of the Emperor first and nothing else second. I mourn the loss of any world, any life. I did not want to see Tanith die, nor did I want to abandon it. But my duty is to the Emperor and the Sabbat World's Crusade must be fought and won for the good of the entire Imperium. The only thing you could have done if I had left you on Tanith was die. If that's what you want, I can provide you with many opportunities. What I need is soldiers, not corpses. Use your loss. Don't be crippled by it. Put the passion into your fighting spirit. Think hard. Most men who join the Guard never see their homes again. You are no different. Most can look forward to living through a campaign and mustering to settle in some world their leader has conquered and won. Slado made me a gift after Balhut. He gave me a military rank of colonel and granted me settlement rights to the first planet I win. Help me by doing your job and I'll help you by sharing that with you. Commissar Colonel Gaunt, following the flight from Tanith. With no officers surviving the evacuation, Gaunt promoted Corbeck to Colonel and Rawn to Major and took Milo on as his adjutant. They were ordered to select squad leaders and reorganise the men as well as motivate them. They were now the Tanif first and only and as the sniper Larkin would quip later on, Gaunt's ghosts. Colonel Colm Corbeck was a big man with natural charisma whom the surviving ghosts rallied around. He taught Gaunt the culture of Tanith, insisting that he wear the camo cloak like the rest of them, and along with Scout Sergeant McCall, instructed him in the Tanith way of war. In battle, he was highly skilled and courageous, leading from the front. With no airs or graces, he would live amongst the troops and became a father figure for the regiment. In the early days, with resentment to Gaunt high, he would lend his support to his new commander, seeing that to survive the wars ahead, the Tanith must be united. Major Rawn was a sly, lean and vicious character, perfect material for the Imperial Guard. He was the predominant leader of the malcontents within the regiment. Later, after many battles and close shaves, he would gain a grudging respect for Gaunt, particularly after he saved his life several times. He swore that he would kill Gaunt one day, but the rage over the loss of Tanif appears to have waned in the following years. He is a respected but feared commander of the regiment now. None doubts his skill nor risk opposing him. He is devoted to the first and only and is willing to throw himself into the fight if it means slaying the arch enemy. Bryn Milo was a civilian pipe player and guide in Tanif Magna, assigned to Gaunt during his visit during the regimental foundation. As the world fell to chaos, Milo saved Gaunt from arch enemy soldiers. Gaunt took the boy with him, meaning he was the only civilian to escape the world. He became Gaunt's adjutant, serving him well as an aide and also providing insights into the mood of the men and their culture. Milo began to exhibit a somewhat disturbing prescience, able to accurately predict when an enemy attack or an odd situation would occur. This would cause problems later, 
as such things are closely monitored by imperial authorities, from the potential dangers of having a rogue psyker within the ranks. But it was never proved that he did in fact bear the abhorrent psyker gene. After several years of service as Gorn's aide, Milo reached the age where he could join the regiment fully, and his time with the commander proved useful, giving him a natural authority amongst the men, but also keen combat instincts. He became a mascot of the regiment, although this lessened somewhat with his induction to full trooper. But he acted as a reminder of lost Tanith, as the ghosts marched to battle or reclined on bunks travelling between worlds, Milo's Tanith pipes could be heard playing the songs of, of their lost homeworld and people in joy and in sorrow. Gaunt, having barely survived the annihilation of Tanith and a potential mutiny from the despairing survivors, prepared to lead these shaken and still untested soldiers into their first engagement of the crusade. Black Shard The planet Black Shard was the first battlefront the ghosts were assigned to following the fall of Tanith, and would be their proving ground to Gaunt after weeks of reorganisation and training on board their transports. The ghosts were ordered to aid in the attack on the old citadel of Black Shard, in support of the 10th Royal Sloka, a regiment of heavy infantry who wore heavy spiked bronze plate armour reminiscent of the techno-barbarians of legend. The ghosts agreed to act as the lead element as the terrain was muddy and infiltration of the citadel relied on using tunnels. Imperial intelligence estimated that a force of around 17,000 cultists along with an undetermined strength of unconventional forces, such as the dreaded spawn, were dug deep into the ruins of the old citadel. Artillery would provide cover for the Imperial advance, and the ghosts would use the tunnel systems to infiltrate the enemy positions, with the Royal Sloker ready to reinforce any beachhead. The ghosts' advance went well, and after some heavy but brief engagements with the cultists, they found themselves holding a large temple within the citadel. This temple housed a foul shrine to chaos, and Gaunt ordered it destroyed with demo charges. Rawn and Gaunt stayed behind to rig the explosives as the rest of the ghosts withdrew. It is postulated from Tanith veterans that some kind of altercation took place between the two, but neither has added anything to the official record. The explosion that followed was greater than expected, or than it should have been given the amount of explosives used, suggesting an unleashing of dark forces. The effect on the arch enemy was instant. With the shrine destroyed, they all, to a man, committed suicide. And instantly, the war for Blackshard was over. A wounded Gaunt reached the Imperial lines 20 minutes after the explosion, carrying an unconscious Major Rawn on his shoulder. General Hadrak, commander of the front, received credit for the victory, but did offer high praise and acknowledge the role of Gaunt's ghosts in the victory, noting in particular their stealth abilities. Voltmund After their victory at Blackshard, the war for Voltmund would be bitter for the ghosts. It was on this world that the ghosts would first encounter the Royal Volpoon, and their future notorious commander, Lord General Notches Sturm. Sturm had active command of the theatre, and had requested the ghost presence as the battle for the planet was dragging on, due to the ancient and powerfully constructed defences of Voltmund's capital, Volsis City. The Royal Bluebloods are a highly skilled and renowned regiment of heavy infantry, drawn from the world of Volpoon. The regiment selects its members from the nobility of the world and committed multiple regiments to the Sabbat Crusade. Although their fighting prowess is rightly respected, the Volpoon are also known for their supreme arrogance and distaste for other regiments, made of what they consider to be low-born peasants. They consider themselves the noblest regiment in the Imperial Guard, and are not afraid of telling others so. This leads to conflict with some regiments, and the Volpoon take a dislike to any force which is not, in their opinion, civilised. Stern believed the introduction of stealth and infiltration experts like the Ghosts, who had achieved greater claim for their almost single-handed destruction of the enemy hosts on Blackshard, would be able to break the stalemate of the siege. The enemy was led by Chantha, a corn champion, who, as well as having a force of experienced cultists at his command, also had a contingent of traitor Astartes, the dreaded world-eater berserkers. 
The cultists were bloated, wretched creatures, heavily armed and uniformed in robes soaked in vats of blood. The ghosts were ordered to rendezvous with the Katzog Serpent's 17th Armoured Regiment before making their way to the siege lines of Voltis City. The Katzog Regiment is recognisable for painting their tanks with turquoise and gold feathers, the feathered serpent being an emblem of their world. En route, the ghost scouts detected a sizeable chaos warband in the woodlands and began to pursue. They caught up with them as they were launching an ambush on the Ketzog Regiment, which, consisting of basilisk tanks and other armoured artillery and transports moving in column, was facing annihilation by a foe, which consisted of seven World Eater traitor marines, who were carving up the tanks and their crews, who aside from the pintle mounted weapons of their tanks and sidearms, had no defence against the gene wrought and corrupted worshippers of the Blood God. The ghosts attacked immediately, and with overwhelming fire managed to slay the surprised traitor Astartes. Although casualties had been taken, the Ketzog had been rescued from almost certain destruction by the ghost's intervention. Both regiments moved onwards to Voltis City, and then to their assigned positions, the Ketzog to provide artillery cover to infantry advancing on the city, and the ghosts to attack the Watergate on the city's flank to either create a breach in the vast walls or gain a beachhead within. The enemy defended this weak point heavily, knowing its vulnerability. After a fierce fight, the ghosts gained entry, but resistance continued within the chutes and tunnels of the water gate. Realising that the gate would fall, the arch enemy opened the sluices, unleashing hundreds of gallons of water, washing the ghosts out. Although at first it seemed the engagement had been an utter defeat for the ghosts, as they scrambled to reassemble through the now submerged plains outside the water gate. By the Emperor's blessing, a force of ghosts slipped through the enemy defenders before the water was unleashed. This force, under Sergeant Klugen, detonated its demolition charges in some of the cisterns within the walls, blowing a hundred metre section of the wall to pieces. The Volpoon Bluebloods launched an all out assault on the city immediately, taking it after heavy fighting with the corn worshippers. This victory would not have been possible without the breach in the war, but for their efforts the ghosts were punished. Official records believe the incident to be an accident of friendly fire, but based on later events and the accounts of those present, it appears that out of pure spite and distaste for what Sturm considered peasants and savages managing to take a position in a day which his forces had been trying to crack for months, he ordered the Ketzog to fire on the withdrawing Tanith. Despite the Ketzog commander, Ortis, protesting, Sturm ordered the strike. Around 300 Tanif died in the attack, including the hero of Voltis, Sergeant Klugen. As the ghosts approached the siege line, the Ketzog were appalled. Records show that Gaunt struck Major Ortis and was threatened with court martial by General Sturm. But Ortis would contradict this, stating that his wounds were caused by a misfiring artillery piece, and so spared Gaunt a court martial. The Imperial forces were withdrawing from Voltis to be replaced by second-rate troops to act as occupation and garrison forces, as per Warmaster Makarov's orders in this phase of the Crusade. When the Ghosts, already loaded on their transport ships, were again, out of spite, ordered back to the surface by General Sturm to assist in the clean-up of the remaining holdout enemy positions. More insult came when the Ketzog were also redeployed to this onerous duty. They were assigned to take the city of Kosdorf, Voltman's second city. The city had been decimated when the Chaos Forces invaded and the population massacred. The Chaos Forces holding the city were of unknown number, but were resisting the Imperial advance. This was a depressing time for the Ghosts. After suffering heavy losses from their battle and their later artillery attack, morale was low. Gaunt himself is known to have worried about the choices he had made in accepting the command of the Tanith and practically ending his career with the command of a remnant force of troops and with few favours amongst high command. No one wanted to be involved in this mop-up operation against these remnant chaos forces, but orders were orders. Gaunt led an expedition to the city and they encountered heavy resistance amongst the ruins of Kosdorf. There appears to have been an element of chaos sorcery involved, drawing upon the fears of the enemy to create manifestations of their deepest thoughts and regrets. The fighting was fierce, and the ghosts fought a withdrawal from the city, inflicting heavy casualties on the enemy. This battle went some way to unify the ghosts due to the psychic attack unleashed upon them, 
and the bonding through combat with Gaunt. After extricating themselves and linking up the rest of the first and only, they appear to have had the majority of the archenemy forces in pursuit when the Ketzog unleashed a mass artillery bombardment upon the area the enemy occupied. The majority of the Chaos forces appear to have been annihilated in this strike, and the dead city of Kosdorf was reclaimed for the Imperium. Ramillies 26843 The conquest of Ramillies was practically over by the time the ghosts were deployed. The Raven Guard of the Adeptus Astartes had struck at the enemy fortresses, annihilating the foe so that the fires from the pyres of their corpses burned for days. The Raven Guard had achieved the victory and had now bigger battles to fight on other worlds, so the ghosts were ordered to hunt down and wipe out those scattered bands of archenemy soldiers that had fled before the Emperor's angels. The ghosts hunted down and destroyed these pockets of resistance until it became apparent that there were no more survivors out in the wilderness. But Scout Sergeant McColl believed that something was still out there. Gaunt, trusting in the judgement of the Scoutmaster, allowed the sweeps to continue for a few more days. But if no contact was made with enemy forces, the ghosts would signal mission accomplished and withdraw. McCall deployed his scouts into the wilderness, trying to hunt down this last foe. He picked up the trail eventually. It was large, that was clear. Ramillies has a species of fern which, upon hearing sound, shoots out barbs, and one of McCall's scouts was killed by these. As McCall moved to investigate with Scout Doer, they found the body of Scout Raffle. Unfortunately, in that moment, Raffle's comm bead went off and the sound unleashed a new wave of barbs, which skewered Doa's leg. As he screamed, their prey was drawn to the sound, and as it stomped into view, McColl recognised it as a Chaos Dreadnought. Its optics had been damaged during the conflict with the Raven Guard, and it had shambled into the forest blind, and clearly had been stomping around for weeks in the wilderness, using sound alone. It slew Doa, who, in terror and pain, cried out. McCall, silent like no other, stalked around the blind beast. He used grenades to manoeuvre the bear moth and set his last rifle on the ground. As the dreadnought stalked towards the grenade sound, its foot struck the rifle. It bent down and picked it up in its vicious claw and raised it to its face. McCall had set the rifle to overload and it exploded in front of the beast's sarcophagus, dealing the final amount of damage to crack it, allowing the wave of spines that flew from all around at the sound of the explosion to penetrate its hide and slay the foul abomination within, skewered by hundreds of spines. With the dreadnought slain and chaos purged from the world, McCall gave Gaunt the news that Ramillies was now free from enemy forces, and the ghost withdrew to the next front. Buse of Felon. The world had fallen from within, when Knockout, known as the Blighted and as the Smiling, started a rebellion of his cult army that overthrew the 32 noble families which ruled the world and crucified them, propping their bodies up throughout the city in places where before the family's heraldic displays had once stood proud. Slado himself at the start of the Sabbath Crusade stated that Buse of Felon the noble and honourable world was one of those he was most eager to reclaim for the Imperium. The Imperial siege of the city was dragging on. The archenemy were dug in and well equipped. The defences of the capital were strong. Gaunt attempted to infiltrate the city via the aqueduct, but the enemy anticipated this move, and although the ghosts made good progress and penetrated the city, they were eventually pushed back. The sniper, known as Mad Larkin, the undisputed best sniper in the regiment, took an opportunity and snuck deeper into the city during the firefight. Knowing his psychological instability, many of his comrades believed he had snapped and deserted, but although suffering from some form of epileptic episode or perhaps being blessed by the Emperor's presence, he made his way to the now desecrated Imperial Chapel overlooking the city. Gaunt had told the ghost before the engagement that the best way to take the city was to slay Nokad, as with his leadership it would take years to break the foe. To that end, Larkin took the opportunity to find a spot and take a shot at the foul cult leader. The ghosts were being cut to pieces as they were pushed back from the city, 
Knockard and his singing and mutated horde advancing upon them, when a single hot shot last round flashed from above, and Knockard's head was vaporised. With his death, the Chaos Forces lost all hope and were butchered by the righteous steel of the Imperial Crusaders. Larkin was found and retrieved from the chapel and hailed as a hero by the ghosts. Typhoon 8 Typhoon 8 was an ice world which had been invaded by an orc force which had moved into the Sabbath world smelling conflict on the cosmic air. The ghosts were dispatched and began operations in an effort to push the Greenskins from the world. Unfortunately, the cunning Greenskins managed to cut up and scatter several TANIF units. Major Rawn's unit was harried and pursued until only he remained, and, wounded, found shelter in an ice cave. Within the cave, he attempted to seal his wounds, but was found by an orc, who proceeded to batter the wounded Major, nearly slaying him. Gaunt was also separated from his unit and found himself entering the cave. He slew the greenskin before he could finish Rawn. Begrudgingly, Rawn allowed Gaunt to attend to his wounds and the two sat around a chemical fire and ate rations and slept after the struggles of the day. They awoke to orcs entering the cave and after an exchange slew these hunters. The two men moved out of the cave and entered the frozen wasteland beyond moving towards the Imperial lines. A mob of orc buggies was pursuing the pair across the snowy plains, checking the caves as they went. They moved into cover, waiting to ambush the next buggy that came close. Hidden by their cloaks behind a small outcrop of rocks, they leapt up, unleashing Laz and Bolter Fire, killing the crew. Leaping atop the vehicle, they removed the corpses and Gaunt sat in the oversized driver's seat, accelerating away with the other buggies in hot pursuit. Eventually, they moved over a frozen lake and the buggy plunged through the weaker ice. Gaunt and Rawn managed to clamber onto a glacier formed from the now rapidly crumbling lake ice before their buggy sank. Several orc buggies plunged into the now open waters and the rest pulled up short, shouting jeers at the two men sat on their glacier as the current took it. This incident would go a long way to bonding the two men and lessening Rawn's animus, as this was the second time Gaunt had saved him. Caligula The invasion of Caligula was a full-scale planetary assault. Several of the planet's hives had fallen to chaos and the Imperium was eager to resecure the world and aid the loyalists on the planet. The main target was the hive Nero. As the drop ships descended upon the city, a vast psychic storm was unleashed on the Crusaders. Many were caught in this tumult. Luckily, the majority of the ghosts had penetrated the storm that now hung over the city. Gorn's own ship was forced down into one of the sunken forested valleys which dotted the surface of the world, which was primarily desert, but for these sunken oases of fertility. Colonel Corbeck led the ghost assault. As they penetrated the hat blocks, the horror of the Chaos forces was made apparent. The things they had done to the population, and what those who had joined the Chaos forces had done, was vile and sick in the stomach of every noble son of the Emperor. The ghosts fought through the hubs and penetrated deep into the city. There they encountered a demonic entity, a vast life form, which, due to the intuition of the sniper Mad Larkin, was determined to be the cause of the storm, which was now holding back the orbiting Imperial fleet as well as their reinforcements from the surface. Corbic contacted their transport, the frigate Navir, and was able to convince the captain to launch a pinpoint o a pinpoint orbital strike on the beast. With its slain, the storm broke and the Imperium was able to feed in additional troops and purge Nero of the Chaos Taint. Away from the city, Gaunt and the survivors from his crashed dropship found a lab which had been growing foul creatures and it is surmised by Imperial intelligence that this was the genesis of the Taint which spread across Nero, corrupting it. Gaunt ordered the site burn to the ground 
The Imperial Invasion Force stayed on the planet for some time to secure it and hunt down enemy forces. The wastelands between the Hive Cities have become lawless regions. We must assume, more than before, with bands of raiders and refugees lining the main highways between them and continuously attacking supply convoys. The ghosts were assigned to defend these convoys and Gaunt in secret was told to hunt these bands down and in that effort, Gaunt laid a trap. The reason for the secrecy was that Imperial Intelligence had discovered that the raiders were gaining intelligence on the convoy's movements from drivers on the large hauler vehicles. Gaunt assigned Try Again Bragg to command the defence of the convoy, much to the horror of many ghosts, who though well liked by his comrades, was considered a bit dim, and many not knowing the truth of the traitors within the convoys, believed that Gaunt was sacrificing Bragg and those other ghosts assigned to defend the convoy. Try Again Bragg was a giant of a man, able to carry and fire heavy weapons that normally would be pintle mounted on vehicles or require multiple people to just move them. His aim, however, was not the best, hence the moniker Try for Try Again Bragg. To many, he seemed like a gentle giant and a little bit dim, but Gaunt could see the man was not dumb or slow. He had just become deliberate because of the great physical strength he had. Also, knowing that people often viewed Bragg as slow, Gaunt selected him for command and gave him a large convoy to defend, hoping to draw out a large portion of the raiders with the promise of rich loot and a poorly led defence. Each of the haulers had a complement of ghosts manning stubbers and armed with las rifles, as well as ghosts on bikes acting as outriders to the front and the flanks. The raiders took the bait, launching a large-scale attack on the convoy. Bragg moved the convoy into a defensible position rather than flee, drawing more of the enemy into the open. As the fighting intensified, at Bragg's signal, flights of marauder bombers descended from the skies, unleashing their payloads on the attackers. Their payloads on the attackers surrounding the convoy, annihilating the greater part of all the raiders in the region. The ghosts had been monitoring the Vox traffic coming from the convoy and discovered that one of the drivers had been communicating with the raiders and was attempting to shoot his way clear. Bragg caved the man's head in with a mighty fist before he could fire a shot. The Tannif first and only were later redeployed to a new front. To continue with the wider campaign, Makarov adopted the features of Slado's earlier strategies, such as Operation Reddrake, pushing the campaign forward but launching multiple small-scale invasions and reliefs of defended worlds. His tactic was to maintain active forces of veteran regiments, deploying them to the conflict zones and then immediately withdrawing them and replacing them with second-line garrison troops. These veteran formations would then be transported to the next world to ensure the Imperial advance was relentless and the best of the Crusade's fighting forces were in the front without bogging them down with occupation and counterinsurgency duties. This whole five-year phase of the Crusade from 765 and Makarov's assumption of command was described by the Warmaster as that time I spent chasing the horizon, but by others as a mad blind rush. There was no madness, however, in Makarov's plan. Risks, for sure, but every one had been weighed up and considered as a well-thought-out plan of advance into the distant Cabal worlds. Every move was considered by the genius of the War Master, even if many of his comrades could not appreciate the scope of his vision. In the next episode, we will cover some of the most intense battles of the Crusade as the Imperium advances towards the Cabal systems. Along the way, they will face treason, counterattack, and the full capacities of the arch enemy's war machine across dozens of worlds. The actions of the Tanif First and Only Regiment, Gaunt's Ghosts, will be pivotal to the fate of not only the Crusade, but perhaps all mankind. Thanks for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to like, subscribe, comment, and share if you can. I have been the Border Prince. And I'll see you next time. Cheers. Hello, fellow citizens. If you'd like to help a fellow Terran out, please use the affiliate links below.
I can heartily recommend Element Games. I use them myself and they've got a great service and they've usually got a really chunky discount available on pretty much everything in the Warhammer range. Not to mention they do War Machine, X-Wing, pretty much everything you can imagine. Also, I see the links to uh, some Amazon recommendations I've got for products that we've been discussing and are available through there. Not to mention the Amazon free trial that's down below. If you'd like to try that service out, I use it myself. It's pretty good. Even if you don't watch the TV, the free postage is awesome. Also, if you follow the link to my eBay account, you can find a bunch of pro painted miniatures and other bits of bobs that are war game related that I'm going to be selling on there. Now, if you're just looking to be generous, there's a PayPal link down below and anything you can send me is really appreciated. I'll be happy to mention you and say thanks in the next video. Down below as well, you can also find all my social media channels uh, and my blog. So pop along to them and if you want to ask me anything or get in touch or just see what I'm up to, I'll be updating regularly on progress of certain projects and what I've been doing. So yeah, I have been the Border Prince. Thank you for watching. I'll see you next time. Cheers.